reporters at the White House uh, uh, quoting Ari Fleischer that the target of the 757 was actually the White House, and also Air Force One was targeted. Uh, can you shed any uh, I'll leave that to the, the White House. House. Uh, I'll leave that to the White House. Mr. Secretary, your comments on the handling of classified information, mm -hmm. does that, are you suggesting that it's time to move to a more uh, secretive uh, uh, government in which uh, there's less transparency about what it is you're doing, and how does that square with the goal of, of, of openness uh, that uh, reassures both our friends and foes around the world that mm -hmm. the United States intentions are good. We all know that there's a wealth of material that's classified unnecessarily and doesn't necessarily need to be. Well, um, I, uh, as, as I'm sure you've discovered, I do believe in openness, and I think it's enormously important in a free system with a free press and, and a, a democratic underpinning to our wonderful success as a country that we, uh, we recognize that and respect it. I also know that you're quite right. There are things that get classified that ought not to be classified. But what I said is enormously important, and that is that when classified information is compromised by people who ought to know better because they're unprofessional or uncaring and perfectly willing to violate federal criminal law, and seemingly willing to put people's lives at risk, their colleagues and their neighbors and their friends, I think it's something that should stop. So yes. Secretary, what's, what's this? Jim's question, folks, I need to, he needs to leave. We need to get you across the river. Was, the last question. Uh, was sloppy handling of classified uh, uh, information, did that play some role in, in the attacks? Um, uh, not to my knowledge. Okay, sir. It, it is an issue that I think, however, needs to be elevated and looked at and, and that people in all aspects of government What's the catalyst? What are you raising that today? Yeah, has it happened in the aftermath? It's a little difficult here, to be perfectly honest, uh, at, least, at least from this chair, to figure out uh, precisely what the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, is saying in all this discussion about you, classified material. Just working backwards, he's just asked my report at the end whether classified information or the leaking of classified information, the availability of inf uh, classified information played any role on these attacks in the United States yesterday, and he wasn't, he wasn't prepared to say yes to that. Uh, but he says uh, three times, not altogether elliptically, um, that uh, he is distressed that, uh, that, that classified information getting out somewhere, somehow, um, is compromised because people are not caring and in some cases violate criminal law, which of course would be the case if someone was deliberately leaking classified information uh, to the press. <clears throat> he speaks uh, in favor of an open press there, but he's clearly frustrated early on about the reporting yesterday um, uh, in, in the news media about the, the degree, the extent of casualties at the Pentagon. And you recall that it was a local fire chief <clears throat> working on the operation, uh, working on the disaster zone at the Pentagon who said uh, to a number of people, including to us, that he thought maybe 800 people would have perished at the Pentagon. ABC's John McCarthy has been reporting uh, repeatedly since early this morning that that number was altogether too high and believes, based on his Pentagon sources, that it might be closer to 200. Um, it took Mr. Rumsfeld a couple of minutes there to figure out what he meant by too high. Was it the 800 or the 200? In fact, it was the 800 figure that was disturbing him, but he will not comment on whether the casualty figures are 100, 150, or 200. But 200 is an operative figure which sources at the Pentagon have been comfortable with at this stage, while saying all the time, I think everybody we've talked to um, in every regard in New York and the Pentagon have made the point that we simply do not know at the moment because it has been, under the circumstances, too difficult to get at precisely um, what the casualty figures are. And this is a far, far greater problem in New York than is at the Pentagon, which, if anything, is a control situation. The Pentagon is more of one than it is in New York City. But Mr. Rumsfeld making a very brief, unannounced appearance on his, on his way uh, to the White House for yet another meeting. And he would make no comment on this report on the record by the President's spokesperson, Ari Fleischer, <coughs> which, among others, Congressman Chris Cox, of California told us a while ago he had heard earlier was the White House has reason to believe that the White House was the original target 
of at least one of the aircraft and not the Pentagon. That in itself has been, um, has been somewhat confusing uh, to, uh, to all of us, and we're working hard now that they've put that out in the public arena to track that one down. We think I can now, Bob Miller, um, settle what's been going on in... John, <laughs> sorry about that. That's only, all right. I think we've you. been here so long, you'd well, I was, recognize yeah, me sooner or later. Only knowing you forever. Um, John, I think we can put Boston into greater context now. Yes, we can. Um, if, you're, if you saw that, you remember that a paper trail from a car believed to have been used by the hijackers at Logan Airport took police and the FBI to a hotel in the center of uh, the city of Boston, the Westin Hotel in Copley Plaza, uh, as they were going to enter two rooms rented by one individual, they literally bumped into three occupants of one of those rooms leaving. Uh, those people have been taken into custody. They are not charged with anything at this point. They are being detained and questioned by the FBI. Uh, but there was concern that there might be other people in the rooms. So a Boston PD SWAT team uh, did a tactical entry into the rooms, uh, found no people, but found a suitcase that a bomb-sniffing dog alerted on, as well as a wastebasket. The wastebasket uh, didn't have anything in it. They could see that uh, by looking, but uh, an x-ray of the suitcase uh, proved suspicious. The bomb squad was able to enter it uh, wearing protective gear. They found it did not contain explosives. <coughs> what it did contain, according to our sources, uh, were papers and pamphlets uh, there was other luggage in the room that seemed to indicate that the rooms had been used by a number of people, more than the three people who were present. And they found something that's been very intriguing to FBI investigators, according to our sources. Uh, they found hair dye products and other things that could be used to change your appearance um, if you wanted to. So the FBI has taken over that uh, crime scene now and the investigation continues. Peter? Thanks very much, John Miller. We're going to the Attorney General of the United States, John Ashcroft. This investigation and recovery is a highly coordinated effort. I want to thank all of the federal, state, the local agencies that have worked tirelessly yesterday and today to help the victims of this act of war find relief and to help the United States of America locate the people who are responsible for these terrible acts of war. Immediately after the first report of a plane crashing into the World Trade Towers, numerous federal agencies coordinating with the White House mobilized their resources. Throughout the day, secure video conferences took place among the National Security Council, the Department of Justice, the Department of State, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Treasury, FEMA, CIA, the FAA, and other federal agencies. Both the President and the Vice President presided over a number of cabinet and sub-cabinet meetings and video conferences. Continuity of government plans were put into effect. Within the Department of Justice, our full resources were put into operation immediately. As I will explain in greater detail in a few moments, these resources have been deployed both to investigate this act of war and to assist victim survivors and victim families. But let me stress that this is not simply a Department of Justice effort. The response of the federal government across the board has been, I believe, from the President of the United States to the rescue workers, magnificent. I'll now turn to the information that the response we have been making has developed. I'll give you the information that we can give you. However, we will give you only facts that we can confirm. You may be hearing things that we have not told you, but some people have the luxury of speculating. We won't speculate, but we'll only give you confirmed facts. And also, we must be careful to protect confidential intelligence sources and the methods of our intelligence so we do not compromise this ongoing investigation or the capacity of this nation to undertake such investigations as this. The four planes were hijacked 
by between three and six individuals per plane using knives and box cutters and in some cases making bomb threats. Our government has credible evidence that the White House and Air Force One were targets. A number of the suspected hijackers were trained as pilots in the United States. The Department of Justice has undertaken perhaps the most massive and intensive investigation ever conducted in America. The full resources of the FBI, the Justice Department's Criminal Division, the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the INS, and other components have been brought to bear and will be focused in this endeavor. Throughout the day and into the night last night, Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson and Assistant Attorney General Michael Chertoff, who is not with us at this moment, and I were present at the FBI's Strategic Information and Operations Center, together, of course, with the director and a number of other individuals. The Justice Department is working closely with investigators, the FAA, and the intelligence community, including the CIA, the NSA, the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Defense Department. Numerous agencies have assigned personnel to the SIOC at the FBI to coordinate investigative efforts so that information which is received on these premises becomes immediately available to the cooperating agencies. And uh, I might add that we reciprocate with similar uh, deployments in a variety of other settings. The Justice Department's Terrorism and Violent Crime Section is coordinating the response of the U.S. Attorney's Offices nationwide. These agencies have a presence at the SIOC here in the FBI 24 hours a day and are coordinating efforts both in the United States and worldwide around the clock. Investigators are reviewing intelligence and have received numerous credible leads. Command posts have been established at all crime scenes. Evidence response teams and the FBI's disaster squad have been deployed to the crash sites. The recovery of bodies and the collection of evidence is ongoing at the Pentagon and at the crash site in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Investigators are working with the National Transportation Safety Board to recover the black boxes from the crash sites. The crime scene at the WTC has been secured, but is not yet a crime scene accessible to investigators. The United States Attorney's Office's terrorism units and the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces are obtaining the passenger manifests, rental car receipts, telephone logs, videotape from parking garages, and pay telephone uh, videotape records at all scenes for review and appropriate follow-up interviews. All investigative resources of the FBI's laboratory and crisis response capabilities have been mobilized. Now let me turn uh, this podium over to FBI Director Bob Mueller to talk more about the investigation itself. Mr. Mueller has just become the director of the FBI. He's brand new in every respect. I want to start by uh, saying that the men and women of the FBI join the nation in expressing our deep sympathies for the victims of these horrific tragedies uh, and their families. And we, uh, all of us in the FBI, pledge to those directly affected by these attacks that we will leave no stone unturned in our quest to help find those responsible and to bring those individuals to justice. Forgive me. Well, 
We'll reconnect with the FBI in just a minute, and we'll get back as quickly as we can, but let's just review what Mr. Ashcroft said. He said uh, he does not want to compromise any sources. New York, where a flight went in, we established command posts. We have at those command posts and at a number of offices around the country where there are leads, more than 4,000 special agents who are assigned to assist this investigation. 4,000 special agents and 3,000 support personnel. We have over 400 of our laboratory personnel deployed at the crime scenes uh, in New York City, uh, south of Johnstown in Pennsylvania, and at the Pentagon. In the last 24 hours, we have been addressing two objectives. The first objective is to determine identify the hijackers on each of the plane, each of the planes. Having identified the hijackers on each of the planes, we then have sought to identify any of their associates remaining in the United States. Our first effort is to identify any associates in the United States who might be related to the hijackers and to remove those associates, investigate, and uh, arrest, given the evidence, those individuals, and to remove any threat to the air system in the future. That is our first objective. The second objective is to gather any and all evidence we have as to whom assisted the hijackers, and not only in this country, but also uh, overseas. We have, in the last 24 hours, taken the manifests and used those as an, evident, as an evidentiary base and have talked to many of the families of the victims and have successfully, I believe, identified many of the hijackers on each of the four flights that went down. We also have identified through a number of leads, principally at the cities of origin, a number of individuals whom we believe may have had something to do with the hijackings, and we are pursuing those leads aggressively. <clears throat> Let me conclude at this juncture by emphasizing again the FBI's total and unwavering commitment to this investigation. We will not stop, and as I said before, we will leave no stone unturned until we have determined who was responsible for these attacks on our freedom. Now, I would be happy to entertain questions, as I'm sure the Attorney General would. Director, Director. Has, has there been any arrests of any of these associates that you've identified the uh, Now, I understand that, uh, that there is reporting out there that the FBI has made arrests with regard to the hijacking. That is not accurate. Uh, there have been occasions where we have interviewed individuals and come to find that the individual is out of status and that individual uh, has been uh, detained on an immigration hold. But there have been no arrests relating to these hijackings at this point. The people that you've um, talked to and the people that you've identified, are these people that have been under FBI's watch in the past relating to other kinds of terrorism and activities? Are they people who you're familiar with? As we identify names, there may be one or more individuals with whom we have uh, information as to involvement with uh, individual uh, terrorist groups. We've seen activity today in Boston, Rhode Island, and in southern Florida. Can you walk us through, in any of these cases, and give us any guidance on why these particular individuals have been uh, uh, stopped and what the FBI is doing? Uh, we have, uh, in Boston, uh, my understanding also in Providence and also in uh, Miami, we have leads indicating uh, the presence at some point in time of either the hijackers themselves, and we are attempting to recreate the, the uh, travels of each of the hijackers on the planes, either the hijackers themselves or their associates. And consequently, we, were following, we are following all leads with interviews, uh, with search warrants, uh, and whatever investigative techniques are necessary to obtain the evidence. Can I ask a real last question? I've got, they've got to get to the White House for a meeting. How many? How many, how many, how many, how how many associates, Mr. Mueller, do you, do you think? And how uh, many more workers at the airport? 
uh, I can't give you a definitive number on the associates. Thank you very much. Robert Mueller, the brand new director of uh, the FBI, following uh, John Ashcraft, the Attorney General. And I think these are the highlights in general, and John Miller, who's with me, will, will, will correct me. And in many cases, Mr. Ashcroft, the Attorney General, confirms some of the reporting today, and Mr. Mueller, in some cases, points out that some of the reporting is not altogether accurate. Uh, there were, as we reported before, roughly three to six individuals involved in every plane, and that knives and box cutters were used by the hijackers, the terrorists, on board to subdue or worse uh, the flight attendants and or the cockpit crews on board. Uh, that they were, we've confirmed this, uh, in some cases trained as pilots in the United States. We don't know the degree of that training, but we did talk earlier to the head of a flight training school in Florida who believes that one of the men who is suspected as having been on board, two of the men who'd been suspected of being on board, um, had in fact taken flight training from him on small aircraft and then gone on and taken at least some measure of jet training um, at another school. And Mr. Ashcroft uh, says very flatly they have information to they have reason to believe that the White House was a target. Now, that raises a question for us here, John Miller, because he doesn't say that the White House was a target and not the Pentagon, as has been reported by Mr. Fleischer, the president's spokesperson at the White House. What he, Mr. Fleischer said, Ari Fleischer, we have reason to believe that the plane that hit the Pentagon what had as its original target the White House, and they also have reason to believe that Air Force One was a target. So that has yet to be. Attack on America, Action News coverage. Action continues. News local coverage continuing right now. We have a lot of local developments to talk about. The first thing is the FBI news conference going on. Going on right now in Somerset County, so let's get to it. I want to take some time to express our gratitude to representatives of the Salvation Army and the American Red Cross, as well as other organizations who provided us with uh, support here on site. As you can imagine, we're working long hours to try to address this uh, issue of the processing of the crime scene. Again, for information regarding attacks that occurred in New York and Washington, you can call 866-483-5137. If you have any information to provide to us, you can call the FBI Pittsburgh office at 412-471-2000 or go to ifccfbi.gov. At this point, I'd like to defer to the Lieutenant Colonel who will speak to uh, United Airlines. Uh, this morning, a number of you had inquired about United Airlines and uh, the response from the United Airlines is that they're their uh, communication through the media would be, or to the media would be from uh, Agent Corvington of the FBI. However, there are a couple numbers that I want to give you. The United Airlines uh, contact number in Chicago is 847-700-5538. They also have a website, www.united.com. The United Airlines contingent has a facility at Seven Springs Resort, which is nearby here. They will have a media room for families who come to this area and opt to talk to the media. The, the phone number at Seven Springs Resort is 814-352-7777. And as I indicated this morning, the information from United is that they have heard from one family uh, this family, supposedly made up of eight members, is on their way to this area by bus from Newark, New Jersey. Beyond that, I have no information from United. From the perspective of the Pennsylvania State Police, obviously not much has changed. Our role is consistent with what it has been since the outset of this, and that is scene security and protection of this area where the plane went down. Now, we're available for any questions you may have. Can we understand that a doctor of Middle Eastern descent has been questioned by the FBI in New Mexico? Apparently, that doctor is from the Shattuck Township in Lawrence County. Can you comment on that report? Again, as earlier, I could only refer you to our office in Pittsburgh, Jeff Colleen. Give him a call. Has, has this gentleman's car been impounded at Pittsburgh International Airport? Again, my focus is the crime scene here. If 
if you want information, contact our office in Pittsburgh. You have, you have no comment? I have no comment. Agent Mr. Crowley a little while ago told us that you were actually not looking for debris or remains at that point. The focus was almost strictly on finding the black boxes. Is that not correct? As I said earlier, as we're doing the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder walkthrough, we are identifying items of potential evidentiary value. Yes, we have an interest in locating the black box, but uh, while we're out there, we're also identifying other things that we have to collect. What are the flags for that they're planning? Two purposes. The first is to identify or mark items of potential evidentiary value for subsequent uh, collection or photography preceding collection, and two, to identify areas that the searchers, if you will, have already been through, so as not to repeat. I don't know. I would imagine what's out there are aircraft parts, human remains, and other items. So what the yellow flags, what do they mean versus what do the red flags mean? I don't know. Agent Corbington, uh, Congressman Murko said he's come to the conclusion that there was some sort of heroic struggle on the, the plane. I, I wonder, do you give any credence to that theory at all? Again, as I mentioned earlier, once we locate the black boxes, uh, we hope that they will be able to answer some of these questions. Overall, could you give us a review of what you know, what you can tell us about what happened on that plane before it crashed? As I told you, until we take a look at the contents of that black box, there's not much for me to say at this point. Are there two separate significant today, yes, sir? Significant today? Yes, significant today. Quite frankly, I don't know what items they may have flagged for potential value. So whether or not they're significant, I, I can't tell you. We've heard some development outside of this area specifically. We've heard that the FBI is investigating uh, a car that's been at the uh, at airport in Pittsburgh for a couple of weeks, not to mention uh, that there's somebody, I guess they're from Newcastle, that uh, they think is of Arabic origin that the uh, FBI in this area wants to question. Do you know anything about this? As I said previously, Feel free to contact Jeff Colleen at our office in the city of Pittsburgh. How many local people at this point might have seen the plane coming in and been interviewed? I don't know how many have been interviewed, but we have interviewed a number of individuals. Are there two separate boxes? Yes, yeah, uh, the plane are there two separate boxes? Are they together or are they actually separate? I'm sorry. I didn't well, feel free to take a look at this photograph. Uh, they appear to be separate, less than 36 inches in length. Pardon me? Again, I have no information along those lines. Sir, do you have any knowledge of any U.S. military aircraft being in the air around the, at the same time in this location when the flight was up? No, I don't. Any aircraft at all in this area? Why wouldn't it have said they saw smaller airplanes in this area? There may have been smaller airplanes in the area as well as perhaps commercial aircraft, but uh, what is to be specific, I, I don't know. Sorry. Or, I'm in no position to tell you what the average size of uh, the debris is until we get out there and start uh, actively collecting. What about the phone calls? The 911 phone call? Again, I defer to Jeff Colleen at our office in Pittsburgh. What about the phone calls? The 911 phone call that uh, what? What? you said that. Uh, you might know some more about what the, what the contents of those phone calls were, the 911 or any of the other ones. Beginning regarding any 911 phone calls, feel free to contact Jeff Colleen in our office. Discoveries, particularly a discovery in Neshanik Township, which is outside of Newcastle and Lawrence County, something uh, very disturbing. Well, we can draw, you heard some kind of testy questioning about that, and obviously the agent there, Randall Corvington, didn't want to talk about it, but we can tell you what we, uh, what we do know about that. Obviously, and again, a lot of the questions there were about the kind of thing that would be rumors and flying around, but there are some things at the heart of some of these.
season to talk about the situation in uh, in Newcastle. Here's what we know. We know that there was a car at Pittsburgh International Airport here Parked that about, had been oh, left for two weeks, I yes, think is what they're saying. Yes, I think September, I have the date here. It's September 2nd. It supposedly was parked there September 2nd. And the FBI did ask Allegheny County Police to impound that car, to take it in for examination. It's at the crime lab right now. That car may be connected to a Lawrence County man, a man who lives at, you heard them say, Neshanik Township. Right. And so there's an investigation going on there as well at the Green Meadows apartment. The FBI is there, as are state police. They accompanied the FBI to that scene. Now, I heard them ask about uh, him, uh, that person being questioned or if that person is missing. We had heard from the people out there that he hadn't been seen for two weeks and that they are looking at some kind of package that was uh, there at that location in Newcastle. It's being called suspicious and that's all. We have a crew in Newcastle yes. and we have, are checking on the situation at the airport as well. So hopefully by the time we get to our five o'clock broadcast, we'll be able to draw together a lot of those threads. I, I think it's interesting and we should uh, insert this here. Um, if anybody remembers the Gulf War, right. I mean, this has been called this has been called a declaration of war, an act of war, and and I, I think Donald Rumsfeld alluded to that in his news conference just a few minutes ago. Uh, there was a concern about r efforts to report in the media that 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 uh, sometimes information that's coming out and rumors may be compromising an investigation. In their eyes, it was the same situation in the Gulf War, and I, I think that 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 uh, is an indication of the seriousness that Washington has about all of this and wanting to keep, keep this battened down and not letting the media find out information that may alert right. or, 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 or distract the investigation. And even as the investigation goes on, a lot of people will be looked at, many people will be questioned. Uh, as Donald Rumsfeld said, some people have been taken into to, for questioning, but they've not been arrested. One other thing that came out of that uh, news conference is, again, there has been no sign of the black box. Uh, there was a question earlier in the day, had they heard the beacon that we often hear about? no sign of the beacon. We do know, and we're going to be learning more about this this hour, and we'll have some information on it at 5, that they're going to be using robotic technology from Carnegie Mellon University to help them search for that black box out at the crash scene. So we hope to know more about that very shortly. Because this is the black box that they were hoping, since it's at an area that is easier to access in the Pentagon, and of course, uh, the two World Trade Center towers that crumbled. I, I believe we also have our link up of a video uh, out at the airport here now. As you know, the FAA had originally talked about resuming our flight schedules at noon today then right at about noon they said no they were not going to do that they were going to uh, continue an indefinite uh, ban on flights but they have here's what we're understanding is that they've towed a couple of the planes that are there uh, into position but we haven't seen any active uh, attempts to take off now the, the flights that are being given permission to even fly today are not new flights right the, the, they are they're flights that actually have been diverted to right. airports yes. in other words they're trying to put the system back in order right. rather than just say everybody take off and go to where you are going so uh, it, it seems to be a step-by-step -step process that the FAA is engaging in and what we're seeing here is just they're they're towing some of the planes so and there's sort of two things to understand about that that there were dozens of flights that intended to land at East Coast Airport yesterday could not came here as a place of safe harbor oasis many of those people stayed in our hotels so one if you see airplanes taking off from Pittsburgh International that does not mean that your flight is on and that you can plan to travel it also does not you don't need to be worried about that if you see planes taking out there will be several dozen flights leaving Pittsburgh International here today all right uh, in the meantime Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania really are stepping up. Uh, we have called or we have established a, a phone bank by the Salvation Army in order to allow you a place to uh, donate and, and to help out and, and, as I said, step up. Right now, so far, here's the number, by the way, 412-243-6000. Uh, $18,000 has been donated thus far and I think this effort started what about uh, noon shortly before noon yeah and just in four hours you and just response to the occasional times we put this number up and there go the phones again have already contributed eighteen thousand dollars and of course every bit of that will go to help in the rescue and recovery efforts we will have a lot that we are covering it's hard to even uh, kind of give you an advanced look at the five there is is so much uh, that we ha we have crews in so many different areas but we will be looking at all of these questions about the scene in Somerset County the question you heard being asked there uh, about this connection perhaps to Newcastle uh, and then we'll have extended coverage from the impact around here Washington New York and what was going on in Boston as a well. lot more developments this afternoon especially uh, in regards to the hijackers um, a lot more of them are known what their movements were where they were getting their training um, 
if it weren't so horrible, it's fascinating. It's fascinatingly intricate, and I think that's what is the most frightening aspect of all of this. All right. All right. Act of war. Was it the realization that both the White House and Air Force One were targeted that elevated his language to talk about an act of war? Was, was it a threat against the head of this country that elevated it to that level? John, I think that the actions against the soil of the United States are what led the president to say that this was an act of war against the United States. But why not use the word war last night in his televised address to the nation? What changed overnight to ratchet up that rhetoric? I think that you're just going to continue to hear the president speak out on a regular basis, and the president will share his thoughts with you as his thoughts develop as a result of the conversations he has with his security team and as he uh, thinks this matter through in his mind and shares information with the public. How much money are you talking about in this spending request? You know, are, are we correct to assume it's in the billions of dollars? That's a correct assumption. Um, and again, once we have specific information, more specific than that, I will get it to you. But the president made it clear that there should not be an open-ended commitment. We'll have, we'll have, as soon as the information is better developed in our conversation with the Congress, I'm going to do my best to provide it to you in specificity. Go ahead. Go ahead. What are you hearing from uh, the president's financial working group uh, about a possible timetable to reopen the markets? And, and how important is that to, uh, to not only investors in this country, but to uh, the global economy? Well, first of all, on the first part of your question, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission, as well as Department of Treasury, are looking at that matter. And so I'm going to leave that answer up to them. But obviously, as the president said today... This last answer by Mr. Fleischer having a reference to the, uh, the impact that the attacks on the United States yesterday may have had on the international financial markets. You know, the stock exchange, New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange are closed today here in New York. Those stock exchanges are open in various other parts of the world. The um, uh, several questions there about why, given a lot of credible evidence that the White House and the administration appears to have about the, uh, at least the attackers today, why he, the president, has decided to release to the public the also credible evidence, they say, that the White House and Air Force One uh, were targets. And a subsequent question there as to why or whether the four planes that were hijacked yesterday, taken into the Twin Trade Towers, into the Pentagon and elsewhere, uh, were actual threats to Air Force One when the president was in many other parts of the country. Just lots of things to get sorted out yet. But I want to remind you of Mr. Fleischer's original statement, as we believe it to be correct. We have a reason to believe, said he to us, that the plane that hit the Pentagon was originally intending to hit the White House. Doesn't answer any of the questions about the plane yet that crashed in, in Pennsylvania. And he also has reason, he said to us, to believe that Air Force One was a target, and he's now said it many times. We'll try to get that sorted out as time goes by and as the uh, search and, and hopefully the rescue operation continues in New York and at the Pentagon. Because you heard the Secretary of Defense a short while ago saying that the early figures that had been bandied about yesterday, about 800 uh, Americans or 800 members, people at the Pentagon had lost their lives in that attack on the Pentagon. He believes those figures are much too high. John McCrethy at the Pentagon is reporting for some time that it is 200 or perhaps lower than that. So a small measure of relief at the Pentagon. Uh, Charlie Gibson was talking to us just a while ago, but Jackie Kavagan, or Kavagan, uh, whose husband works for Cantor Fitzgerald and who worked on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center, and um, uh, she was looking for her husband. We're also following that story, too. But I want to follow along with what Mrs. Bush was talking about in terms of the children, because we've heard it in every corner of the country today, how how difficult, how awkward it is to talk to the children about this violence. And Deborah Roberts has been talking to some children um, in a school, ABC's Deborah Roberts today, on how these events have affected them. I'm sure we learned something from them. Most of the kids here at Washington Irving Intermediate School went to class today deeply troubled and preoccupied. It's a commuter suburb. Many of the kids have parents, relatives, or friends who work in New York's financial district. Some didn't come home last night. For them, the disaster doesn't make sense. It hit too close to home. I was kind of freaked out because um, the Empire, the, the Twin Towers were like my favorite two buildings. Uh -oh. So when I, when, I, when, I watching, when I was watching the news and I, I saw them collapse, I'm like... Those two guys who I, I heard that they hijacked the planes mm. and took those people out of the planes and killed them, 
because they hated the United States. Mm -hmm. That's what I heard. Someone um, in the plane wanted um, to kill a certain person. While so many children are confused by the details of the disaster, clearly most of them are consumed by emotion. In classroom after classroom, there is talk of fear, anger, and mostly sadness. I just burst out in tears, because, I mean, it was horrible. Just thinking about it, my legs tremble and stuff. The children, they're like, Daddy, where's my mom? Or Mommy, where's my dad? Like, where are they? Are they trapped inside the building, or are they still, like, alive? Why was it um, important to you to have the kids talking today and writing in their journals. They all had stories they wanted to talk about, and we need to talk about it. We can't pretend that it didn't happen. It's a jarring start to the first week of school, children struggling to deal with a complex lesson in life. Well, we've, we've all said it so many times, it applies to adults as well as children. We need to talk about it, and it's particularly important, those of us who are parents know, to talk to our children and also to listen to our children. We're joined now by Dr. Howard Koplowitz, who is the director of the New York University Child Study Center. Dr. Koplowitz, do I understand at, in the first instance that New York City, the Board of Education, has asked you to develop in the wake of this incident uh, something of a program so that families and kids can work better together? Well, I think it's important for you to know that not only the Board of Ed, but also the parochial schools and the independent schools of New York City actually work with us throughout the year. So it's almost as though having a fire drill. They teach us and we teach them. So that when this happened, uh, in fact, even today, we met with an entire school district of District 2, which is where several schools had to be evacuated near the World Trade Center, uh, talking to principals about how to prepare teachers tomorrow and what to look for in kids. Quite clearly, the kids who are most at risk are the children who have the most personal involvement, whether they were there and witnessed the event or whether their parent is lost or um, has died in this uh, or been injured in this terrible event. Now, this is a universal problem. How do we talk to our children about, uh, about acts of violence, when they, which they do not necessarily readily understand? I know we all have somewhat different ideas about this. Uh, let me be parent for a second. I've always believed the first thing to tell your children was that you are safe and that the bad people out there are not after you. Is that good advice? Well, it also, it really depends on how old the child is. And the best advice would be to start off by asking the kids what they understand and what they've heard. Uh, remember, the TVs have been on in most people's homes for hours and hours every single day. Um, this is an extraordinary, historic, and horrific event. So across the United States, all of a sudden, because it occurred in New York, it's part of our backyard. It's in our neighborhood. And so, number one, talk to your children if they're very young and find out what they know, and then explain about the good guys and the bad guys, and that we are going to find the bad guys. There's no ambiguity about this, and that we have a government that is taking action to make it safe. Because kids are most interested in what's happening to me. Who's going to pick me up at school tomorrow? Can we go on the plane? to grandma's house for Christmas, and reassuring them is important. For older kids, though, and for kids under the age of five, I don't think they should be watching TV. Yeah, but what do you do about that? You've just made the point yourself. All across America, television sets are on all the time, in homes all over the country. How, uh, do, you, do you do any harm by telling your kid you can't watch that? Yeah, uh, I don't think it's any harm. I think it's a positive parenting kind of technique to say, you know what, you're going to watch in another room, and you're going to watch a, uh, a video on the VCR, or I'm going to shut off okay. the television, and I'll do it, you know, twice a day. In the morning, I'll watch and in the afternoon I'll watch, but it's adult images. It's very important to remember that a little child who sees a scene again and again of that plane going into the mm -hmm. World Trade Center doesn't understand that it's not happening again and again, that it's just one event, and it becomes more frightening. Kids don't like to see parents out of control. They don't like to see the adults in the world out of control. And if they're older children, if they're more than six years of age, and let's say six to 12, mm -hmm. parents should sit with them while they're watching. They should help them comprehend comprehend what's going on. And again, I would monitor how much time you're going to watch the news. I think you're doing a great job, but I think there's a limit to how much a family with young children should be watching this program. I think uh, you quite agree. I agree with you on this. You certainly got to ration television under all circumstances, certainly on, under these circumstances. Um, let me just try a couple of uh, academic questions with you. I'll, I'll try to play a child here, 5 to 12, you, you, you pick a figure. Um, why is it happening, Dad or Mom? Right. I, I think that, again, 
being able to talk in a, in a in language that children understand and to explain, by the way, that you're frightened also, but that there are people who are who are bad, who dislike us or hate us without really knowing us and have taken an action against us that is really horrific. It's absolutely horrible. And we weren't, pre we weren't prepared. We didn't know that something like this could happen. And now the government is going to become more, uh, first of all, they're getting very good at trying to find these people. As we heard from the Attorney General and from others in charge, they're going after the bad guys. But also, they're going to make the airplane safer. Mm. We're going to see that the next time we go on an airplane. And the important part is, in your life, we're going to keep it very safe. Your school is safe. I'm going to make sure that when you go to school, I'm going to be around. And you're going to reassure them. You should also be aware that even when you talk to kids like this, the conversation isn't a one-shot deal. This is a kind of conversation that, depending on your child, who might not be that talkative, you might have to bring it up again later on. Or they may not want to talk about it, and they might want to draw a picture, or they might want to write a poem about it. Not everyone behaves the way we'd like them to behave when it comes to talking about difficult topics. But parents have to bring this up. This is not one of those topics where if you don't say anything, your kid isn't thinking about it. He's just hearing from you that you're nervous about talking about uh, this I, difficult I, topic. I would also guess that this is one of those moments when you can teach your kids some good lessons about prejudice, given the fact that we are all talking about people from a particular part of the world may have done this. I think Mayor Giuliani hit the nail on the head when he was talking about that because that's a very important message for all children, but particularly for teenagers, that it's really time to start talking about tolerance. It may not be a time where we don't feel hateful right now and angry, and particularly when we see scenes of Palestinians dancing in the street, but those people don't really know us, and that's what we're supposed to tell our kids and explain to them the fact that they may hate us and not know us doesn't give us the right, and it certainly isn't smart for us to hate them back. That this whole thing started because of an insane hatred. And that's important. The other important part is to help kids do something. And you know, kids want to volunteer. You know, you find that pre adolescents and teenagers want to do this. Unfortunately, there's nothing for them to do. The Red Cross mm. has got things under control. And you find that, you know, there's no, this is not the kind of war where you're going to make bandages. And so helping children feel about m memorializing this and saying it's important is good. My 13-year-old made a friendship bracelet for me, and his friends have started to do this. Mm. It's red, white, and blue, and they're saying it's to remember the people who've gotten hurt, but to also announce that New York is a strong place, and they're going to start sending these bracelets like a yellow ribbon mm. to the mayor and tell him he's doing a good job, or right. to the president. That kind of doing something, a bake sale where you raise money, whether it's for the children or the families who have lost uh, right. their father, that's important also. Taking a proactive approach. Now you certainly sound like an advocate of it. Thank you very much, Dr. Harvey Koplovich from the NYU Child Studies. I'd be interesting to tell you on this question of, uh, Dr. Howard, uh, uh, on this question of people seeing people dancing in the streets. I've had several emails in the last several hours uh, from the Middle East saying that for every Palestinian dancing in the street, there are others who want to hold a vigil outside the American consulate in East Jerusalem to identify with the United States. And so I quite agree. It's a, it's a moment when prejudices get started or get enhanced, and it's not the time for it. You're right. Thanks very much, Dr. Howard Koplowitz from the New York University Child Study Center. Let us now turn back to the investigation itself. It's about 4.30 uh, in the east, 1.30 in the west, uh, and uh, we're on the second day of a relentless investigation as to who was involved in and responsible for these attacks on the United States, and the even more, the even more important, in the immediate sense, relentless search to see whether or not people can be saved uh, who are somewhere beneath the rubble of the twin trade towers in New York City. Um, and it does appear that, that much of the investigation in that regard has been completed at the Pentagon, but we're not 100% sure of that. I want to go back uh, to Miami now, because the FBI has been at, at real at work in Miami. Today, ABC's Jeffrey Kaufman is there. Jeffrey, you listened to the Attorney General and the Director of the FBI talking about the investigations there. What do you know on the ground? Well, Peter, what we know is that the investigations down here are happening in a number of locations. Here in Miami, across on the Gulf side, in, in Venice, Florida, and, and up north in Vero Beach, uh, south of Daytona Beach. What we can tell you is, uh, on the scanners, our, our affiliate, our colleagues at WPLG, the Miami affiliate, picked up a bolo, which is a be on the lookout alert to, to local police for a man named Amer Kamfar, also known as Amer Taib Kamfar. The description is a 41-year-old man, 5 feet 9 inches, black hair, brown eyes, stocky build, 
They give the, he was driving a 1996 Silver Plymouth Voyager. But Peter, listen to this. There's, they, this is issued by the FBI Terrorism Task Force. They say use extreme caution. This man is armed with an AK-47. Now, what's not clear in this is whether the man was on the flight, presumably not, because uh, they are looking for him. Now, we ran the tag on that plate. It took us to an address in Vero Beach. We then did a further search, and not only did it take us to the one, to, to, to one address where, where his license plate is associated, but it took us to a second address, the same address that the FBI have been searching in Vero Beach all day. We also checked out his pilot status, and he is approved as a, he is a licensed pilot with an enormous number of qualifications, including flight engineer. Let me just turn to another point down here. Now, you just may remember... You, just before you go on, you go on for there, this man appears to have two names on this be on the lookout thing from the FBI Terrorism Task Force, which you actually sent us, and he's got an, also an AKA, also known as. Is, is this a man who, as of now, there's reason to believe was an associate of the hijackers or the terrorists, or may have been on the plane? What do we know about this character? Well, well I... I I, I think it's fair to say that if there's a bolo, a be on the lookout alert being issued, that, 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 that there may, he may well be alive. Uh, presumably, if they were sure that he were dead, they wouldn't be telling people to look out for him. Yeah, they, makes, yeah, go ahead. That makes they, sense. This is issued by the Terrorism Task Force of the FBI. They are saying he is extremely dangerous, use mm -hmm. extreme caution, and they believe, as I've noted, that he may be carrying an AK-47. And, and you believe this was issued today? Well, we certainly heard it on the scanners today, that's correct. And, and all right, okay, go next event. Well, next event, earlier in the day we were talking, and I know you've talked to the people in, in, uh, in uh, Venice, Florida, where uh, a man named Mohammed Atta uh, was, took some flight training at a local flying school, Huffman Aviation. I believe you spoke with the proprietor there. One of the questions that came up there, and, and you asked the proprietor, was, was would this qualify him to fly a 757 or 767? And that's just a small local flying school where you learn to fly a four-passenger plane. The answer is no. But if you look, you don't have to go far, Peter, to find where you can get certification. Here in Miami, for example, there's a, an organization called Flight Safety Boeing that teaches people how to fly commercial aircraft. Just look on the internet and you can find that there's an 18-day course that will certify you to fly a 757. Okay, thanks very much, Jeffrey Kaufman in Miami with those two developments, the be on the lookout from the FBI the Terrorism Task Force, which we're not altogether certain was issued today, but, uh, but, but we think it was, and Jeffrey Kaufman uh, reaffirming that there are places in Florida where you can learn a small, a small aircraft and also a bigger one, as they told us down there earlier today. So. Um, Go back to this search for the families of, uh, for the employees of Cantor Fitzgerald who worked uh, very high up in the World Trade Center. We were talking to the woman who couldn't find her husband. Uh, Connie Chung has actually been following this story in terms of the company as a whole for much of the day, and here is her report. I swear on my mother and father, God bless her soul, I will take them out right now. After an anxious vigil for much of the night at this makeshift command center near St. Vincent's Hospital, two miles from the World Trade Towers, many families share a common bond. Their loved ones work for the same company and are still missing. My son is Lloyd Rosenberg. He worked for Cantor Fitzgerald in one uh, tower one on the 102nd floor. And I'm begging the people that would know anything, please, Get in touch with me. Cantor Fitzgerald, one of the world's largest bond dealers, had nearly 1,000 workers on the top floors of the North Tower, inside the killing zone. My brother was an employee of Cantor. His wife received a call from him this morning that he heard a bang, and then there was smoke all over, and then they got disconnected. Robert Sleewak, 42, was a broker at the company. His family hasn't heard from him since. He said something about evacuation, so the family thought he was more or less in the process of evacuating. And that was very early in the morning, but um, as you know, I'm here now, and we haven't heard anything from him at all. So um, we're just hoping and praying. I told him I'd come down and find my brother for her and my parents. Pat Sleewak felt certain her brother would be found alive. After all, he was a survivor. But what's so horrible is he had cancer and he just passed the five-year mark and this had to happen. Anyway, 
We're hoping that as lucky as he was with that, he could be this lucky too. We, we just have in our head that he's unconscious, his, his ID is down in smoke right now, I guess, right? And that um, he's somewhere in a hospital unconscious or on uh, Liberty Island. I mean, I refuse at this point to give up. Here's my son with my little granddaughter. Michelle Rosenberg spoke with her son, Lloyd, 31, shortly before the blast. He was eating breakfast at work. They made plans for lunch later in the week. And he said, bye, my, I have to go now. And that was it. There's no words to describe it. I, it's just like I'm not living. Like I, I died and this is just a very bad dream. That's all I could say. And I'm just pleading with people out there. If anyone knows, please call us. These families, linked by a company, are now forever connected by tragedy and dwindling hope. You think you may have a shot, but as time goes on, as optimistic as I want to be, it's harder to stay that way. The employees and the families of Cantor Fitzgerald, and there is the scene. You can just see the smoke continues to come up from the particular, the very specific area of the Trade Center. That open area you're looking at over by the Hudson River on the lower side of Manhattan is, of course, the staging area where large, large amounts of material from the federal government, the various state governments, the city have all been gathered so they can go and work on this one site. And we were uh, quite stunned to hear earlier on today, a couple of hours ago, that the collateral damage, boy, that's a phrase that's become famous through a lot of combat and violence, the adjacent damage uh, has been done to many, many buildings in the immediate area uh, of the Twin Towers itself. And there is a continuing, relentless investigation there, and not only for evidence of the crime, that's very much the secondary fact, but for people who may still be alive underneath all of the rubble. And the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, has very carefully said time and again, we do not know how many people are missing. But that is the story from, from, uh, from Connie Chung about the employees of Cantor Fitzgerald, a story that is repeated over and over and over again, given all of the companies that had their offices in the Twin Trade Towers and, for that matter, all of the people, the more than 260 people who died on the four aircraft. And Barbara Walters is here to move that story forward. Barbara. Well, Ted, uh, Ted, I'm sorry, I'm, I was just about to talk about Ted Olson, who is the Solicitor General, and who uh, lost his wife, they were married for five years, on that plane that crashed into the Pentagon. What I have been doing much of the day is to speak to families of people who were on the planes. And Ted Olson was perhaps the best known government uh, figure. Very, very close marriage. Many people may know his wife, Barbara Olson, because she was on cable television a great deal as a commentator. Very vibrant, very intelligent, a great deal of zest. And uh, I remember her very well. Uh, she had called her husband just a little while before she uh, took off on the plane, and he felt pretty good about things because he had just talked to her. Then he went to television, and an assistant said, there's been a crash, and he saw uh, the double crash on a replay and was somewhat relieved that she wasn't on that plane because he knew that she was going to go to, uh, to California and, but was not coming from Boston. A short time later, however, she called to say, I'm on the plane, the plane is being hijacked, and they were cut off. He alerted the Justice Department command center immediately, then he got the connection back, and his wife said, they, plural, they have knives. The passengers, she said, had been herded to the back of the plane. She was very calm. She asked him, what should the pilots do? He said, I don't know, but he said, can you see what the ground looks like? And then we'll know where you're heading. She said, all I see are houses, are buildings. And then the call abruptly ended. He said there were only 58 people on that 757, so it was relatively empty. But he tried to follow some of the things that she said, including they, they had knives, this is what they did, they were very organized. I asked him how he remembers his wife. I mean, just before you go yes, on to that, you're talking course. in this instance about American Flight uh, 77, which was a Boeing Siphon 57 with, I think, 57 people and a passenger crew of six on board, which crashed into the Pentagon. Uh, I, I've had my fingers wrong. He told me 58. I don't know whether it's 57 or 58. Right. The Solicitor General said 58 in any event. He said uh, that he remembers his wife's great zest, her luminous quality. She lit up the room when she walked in. He said she was a huge presence in everything she did. They were very, very close. And her last words before the phone went dead were, I love you. 
Uh, he was very calm. I asked how he was bearing up, Peter. He said, it just hasn't hit him yet. Now, not everybody, of course, is somebody who's very well known. This is a victim named Christopher Newton, very attractive young man. He was on American Flight 77 from Washington to Los Angeles, and that's the flight that crashed into the Pentagon. He was an executive on his way to California to pick up his dog, Peter, which they had left in California, a yellow lab. And as a matter of fact, he was a member of the Million Miles Club for frequent flyers, and he had moved his family uh, east so that he wouldn't have to travel so much, but they had left the dog, and he was going back to get the dog. He survived by his parents, a wife, and two children, Michael, age 10, and Sarah, seven. He was a little league coach and a Cub Scout leader. Here you are, just, Peter. I just, just take that picture out of yes, your hand so people can you. have a look at it. All right. Okay. Peter, take this one as well, if you'll be kind enough. This is Al Marchand. He is married with a son, was married with a son and two step stepsons. And he recently ended up making a life change and it cost him his life. He'd been a police officer and a fireman for 17 years before he decided, as he put it, to join the friendly skies and become a flight attendant. He was 44. He was working on United Airlines Flight uh, 175 from Boston to Los Angeles. Uh, when it crashed into the World Trade Center. And his fellow officers have talked about him. They said that he was enthusiastic and vibrant, and they believe he would have reacted like a police officer on that plane, and he probably did. Two other just short ones, a whole family that was killed, the mother, the father, and their children. And we talked to, uh, this is uh, Lee Hansen, the father of Peter, his son who was killed, and he said, in spite of the fact that the death is a tremendous loss, the one thing that gives them peace is knowing that they all died together and that they died together with God. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, <clears throat> Thomas Burnett, he was on the United Airlines flight when it crashed into Western Pennsylvania. And what is interesting about them is that he called his wife, Dina, from the plane to tell her that the flight was doomed, but that he and two other passengers were going to try to, in his words, do something about it. He called from the cell phone. He was 38. He was the father of three. He also told his wife that one passenger had already been stabbed to death, and he reportedly said, I know we're going to die. We're going to try to do something about this. And his last words were, I love you. And perhaps the best known uh, of, of the people is a man named um, David Angel, who is the uh, creator and the executive producer of Fraser and of Cheers and of Wings and B.B. Newworth, uh, who appeared on Cheers for so many years. And you can, uh, there he is, and very creative and evidently very kind man. And uh, um, also was the creative genius behind Fraser. So we talked to B.B. Peter just a few minutes ago, and we have that prepared to show to you. Bibi, what went through your mind when you heard that David Angel and his wife were on that plane that crashed into the World Trade Center? I, it's, it's been so hard to wrap my mind around the whole event that this just was another surreal uh, moment, and I was, uh, it's devastating. What do you remember most about David? What picture comes into your mind? Well, he had a, a, a very, he was a quiet man, and I, my picture of him is a very quiet, strong presence. He was deeply intelligent and deeply funny, and uh, his understanding of how the, all the shows that he worked on worked and how to make things funny and how to make them smart and speak up to the audience as opposed to down to the audience, he, had, he was a gentleman. So I just see him as that quiet gentleman. Your character on Cheers, Lilith, uh, was very deadpan and, um, <laughs> well, lacked social skills, shall we say. Yes. yes. Was that uh, David Angel's creation? Well, it's hard, uh, it's hard to say who did what. Somehow these guys, and I don't know who was responsible for what in the room, and they would, you know, David and Peter would probably be better at, at answering that, but somehow under his, uh, under his watch, these, these uh, characteristics of, of Lilith came out onto the page. And, and it was on the page. But if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. You talked earlier today to Kelsey Grammer, who of course mm -hmm. plays Fraser. 
I know we, I came in in the middle of your phone conversation yeah. with him, and I know that he was terribly broken up. Well, yeah, he'll, he's going to make a statement on behalf of everyone tomorrow, so I really can't speak for him. But um, I think it was uh, I found a little comfort in in talking to him, and I hope he found a little bit in talking to me. Maybe there may be members of David Angel's family or his wife's family mm -hmm. um, who might like to have some final thoughts from you. Well, uh, I will remember him always. There will be this one person, at least, who will remember him as a good and kind and um, lovely, lovely man. And my heart and my, all my wishes of peace go to his family and his wife's family, as well as all of the uh, victims' families. Barbara, thank you very much. I think most the toughest thing in the world is to talk. There's four more individuals you've helped us to understand in terms of the personalities who perished yesterday. Don't you find it harder to talk to families of people who've died than any other single conversation you ever had? Absolutely, Peter. I think when I do, I wear two hats. I mean, I saw you yesterday talking about your own children, and the tears came into your eyes, and I get tears in my eyes talking to these people. And one is the, the Barbara Walters hat that almost hates to make the phone call. Uh, except it's a way of their paying tribute, and the other is to allow people to see that these were human beings and not just statistics. Well, thank you very much. I hope you'll continue to try to talk to people because uh, it helps to give us a picture that <clears throat> a people is simply more than numbers. Thank Thanks very much, Barbara Walters. Uh, we're waiting at the moment for the Secretary of Transportation, Norm Mineta, to come and brief. In fact, we've been given, I think, a two-minute warning which doesn't mean anything in this, in, in, on this particular day, and we all understand that. Two-minute warning to say they're going to start a briefing. Um, but I think uh, all of you in the country now know what the situation is in very general terms in term uh, about transportation in the country today. Uh, because aircrafts and airports all over the country are frozen. Uh, they're frozen by a long list of new demands or new requirements the Federal Aviation Administration wants to put in place, in part under the pressure of the airlines themselves for security. <clears throat> which means it's going to be a good deal more difficult for passengers, I think, in the long, in the short run as well, if not the long run, uh, to travel. But I think there are vast numbers of people, not just in terms of the immediate personal travel or business travel, but in terms of shipping things across the country. How will people get home from places where they have been stranded for much of the last 24 hours? It is Mr. Mineta, the Secretary of Transportation, who is supposed to be able to answer all of those questions. And he's going to appear in Washington. He's been part, clearly, of all these briefings the President has had today. And, and in the remote chance that you've, not in the remote chance, but in the chance that you've just joined us, we've heard from the White House, we've heard from the State Department, we've heard from the FBI, and now from the Secretary As of Transportation. As the uh, President said last night, these despicable terrorist attacks have shaken the foundation of our greatest buildings, but they have not shaken the foundation of this great nation. And I hope that we will all heed the President's call to keep the victims and their families in our prayers. Now, effective immediately, I have directed the Federal Aviation Administration to reopen on a limited basis the nation's commercial airspace to allow flights and passengers who were diver diverted yesterday to be able to continue on to their original destinations. Only passengers on the original flights will be allowed to reboard under strict uh, security, and only after airports and airlines have implemented strict screening measures. Now, airlines will also be allowed to reposition empty aircraft in preparation for the resumption of regularly scheduled airline service. I have also directed that the FAA temporarily extend the ground stop order that was imposed yesterday while additional security measures are being completed and we continue to assess any potential threats. Safety is always of paramount importance 
and in these extraordinary times, we intend to be vigilant as we remain committed to resuming commercial flights as soon as possible. Therefore, I have ordered a variety of security measures to be instituted at our nation's airports upon reopening to improve the security of our aviation system. A thorough search and security check of all airports and air, uh, airplanes will take place before passengers are allowed to enter and reboard aircraft. We will discontinue curbside check-in at the airport and passengers will be required to go to the ticket counters to check in. We will also discontinue off-airport check-in. We can no longer allow passengers to check in for their flights at hotels or other venues. Passengers must check in at the airports. We must reserve boarding areas for passengers only. Only ticketed passengers will be allowed to proceed past airport screeners to catch their flights. And all vehicles near airport terminals will be monitored more closely. I know that all Americans want us to move as quickly and prudently as possible to return our national airspace system to normal. And we will, as soon as we can do so safely. In addition, I have the following announcements to make concerning other major transportation modes and venues. Major railroads are reporting normal uh, operations and minimum delays. Amtrak is operating on a normal schedule and has returned normal operations in the Northeast Corridor. Many bridges connecting Manhattan and New York City remain closed, open only one way, or with limited access. New York City Transit is 95% operational with the exception of the traffic around the World Trade Center site. Washington, D.C.'s Metro Rail system is operating on a regular schedule. Greyhound bus service has returned to normal operations. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, in terms of their terminal operations, remains closed. Our biggest concern is for the victims of yesterday's terrorist attacks. I would also like to commend our Department of Transportation employees who have shown, shown an outpouring of support. Hundreds of our employees have asked what they can do in the wake of this catastrophe, whether donating blood or supporting rescue efforts. The United States Department of Transportation has been coordinating industry volunteer efforts to provide buses to transport emergency rescue personnel to Stony Creek, Pennsylvania. Again, let us leave here this afternoon with our thoughts and our prayers for the victims of yesterday's terrorist attacks. Secretary, to take a couple of questions now, Jonathan Slam. Okay. Both the General Accounting Office and the Office of Inspector General said that part of the problem with security airports are the low-paid, high-turnover screeners. What's being done to improve the screening of passengers before they board the planes? Well, we started this process actually uh, earlier this spring uh, by <clears throat> coming out with a rulemaking to allow the Department of Transportation to have the increased uh, powers or authority to do, to require uh, not only in terms of uh, requirements, but the monitoring of the screening uh, people at airports. And so as part of that process, we are looking at the whole issue 
of how to improve uh, the uh, ability to screen passengers as they come into the airport. As I said, one of the things that we're going to say is that no passengers are going to be allowed beyond that point. So they will only be screening passengers from now on. The second part of it is how do we make sure the ability of those folks and what they're doing in terms of screening passengers is increased. That process we had started back in May of this year, I believe it was. Well, this is Norman out of the Secretary of Transportation, and he's given some very clear directions uh, to the country and to the Federal Aviation Administration. He says, let me just r run through it quickly for anybody in the country who wants to go anywhere, who wants to ship anything, and who may be waiting for somebody to come from somewhere else. Uh, the, the, you cannot underestimate, with 40,000 flights uh, back and forth across the United States uh, every day, how important to the national uh, well-being, to the national commerce, this actually is. Mr. Mineta has, has told the FAA, FAA that he's going to open, reopen, on a limited basis only, the national airspace. And he's only going to do so at the outset so that diverted flights, those many flights which were diverted uh, under the immediate order of the FAA yesterday, can continue and only original passengers who were on those flights will be allowed to board those aircraft to go on to their destinations and they will have to be screened very strictly for security. This will also give the airlines an opportunity, Mr. Mineta says, to reposition some of their empty aircraft so that in stages the national airline system can begin to approach something like normality and it's clear to everybody who's paid attention to this that it's going to take some days. Um, he is going to continue to extend, he's going to temporarily extend the ground stop order and that we think means applying to all other flights at the moment so that he can assess the threats uh, to the national system, individual airports, individual aircraft and that is going to take some time and he's going to change some um, procedures and some modalities at the various airports around the country. Um, uh, search and security checks of all planes before passengers can board. No curbside check-in anymore. You won't be able to check your bag at a hotel if you're going to go to the airport. Uh, passengers will be allowed in the boarding area only. Railroads are running normally. Amtrak is back to normal. The bridges to New York are still closed. A New York Transit is 95% operational and Greyhound is working normally and the Port Authority in New York, as we all know, is still closed. We're going to pause for just a few seconds to allow local stations on the eastern part of the country to cut away and we'll be right back. Attack on America. Action News coverage continues. The deliberate and deadly attacks were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. An apocalypse visible far above the surface of the earth. Freedom and democracy are under attack. Battleground, America. But in the fight, the flag still stands. Make no mistake about it, we will win. Good evening, everyone. The Pennsylvania front in this effort involves new information from the crash scene in Somerset. And a developing news story about FBI interest in a man from Newcastle and a car left at Pittsburgh International. Let's look at the battlefronts. The suspects in Boston, crews in riot gear, swarmed a downtown hotel looking for evidence and individuals. The search in New York, weary crews and a moment of hope. Another survivor pulled from the rubble today. The strategy, strong talk from the Pentagon about response and word about threats to the White House and Air Force One. And that brings us back here to Somerset County and that uh, field of debris there, the task of plotting the wreckage there on the grid, identifying it piece by minuscule piece. They're still just mapping and gridding today. Earlier today, the FBI said it's a process that will likely take three to five weeks. We want to continue our coverage live from Shanksville with Mike Clark and Michelle Wright, the very latest on the investigation. Now, you guys have been there since yesterday. What happened? Well, Sally, it's got many, many new developments tonight to pass along to you. First, United Airlines has sent a team here to Somerset County for two reasons. First, to help investigators in their massive search that's going on right now as we speak. And secondly, to assist the families who have to deal with just incredible grief. And in fact, one of those families is already on its way here to Somerset County. That's right, Mike. Eight members of the family is en route by bus from Newark, New Jersey to Seven Springs. We're not sure what they'll have to say, but we will let you know if they have anything at all to say. Let's bring in right now Special Agent uh, with the FBI, Bill Crowley. Thanks for joining us. Tell us, first of all, what uh, progress you made today. Well, we've basically been able to lay out the grid. We're working on the grid. We had people walk shoulder to shoulder. 
uh, about 80 investigators are working the crime scene. They did two things. They're working on getting a uh, grid where things are, and they're focusing primarily on the black box to see if they can locate that. Uh, if they have come across any pieces of evidence that could be potentially uh, helpful in the investigation, then they're going to they, then they've marked it. So we are we have started. I do want to emphasize though that this is going to be a long, drawn out process. It's very difficult work. It's very hard work. It's and it's going to be very meticulous. It has, has to be done meticulously. So people have to really uh, be patient. Uh, we are just as interested in getting information as everyone else, but we have to take our time and do things right. No black box yet. No black box yet, that's correct. Special Agent Crowley, we've talked to many people here in the community. Now this is day two. Um, how many people first have you spoke to here in the, in the town saying that they are witnesses, and how do you tell the credible ones from the not so credible? We've talked to a number of people. Any, any information that we get, we're going out to talk to them. Even if someone, it doesn't sound like it's very promising, then we'll go on. We'll still go out and talk to them and determine, uh, we'll determine ourselves whether or not it's credible or not but anything that we have will go out you're looking at every lead then any lead that we get anything of any that's plausible we will pursue aggressively how many people have you talked to here in town uh, i don't have a number but uh any we've as i said any lead we've generated we're hoping that uh, anything that comes in will generate i also want to note that uh, every law enforcement agency has people working on this uh, particularly uh, ATF, the postal inspectors have a lot of people doing an awful lot of work on this investigation. It is a law enforcement um, uh, effort, not just one agency. And let me switch gears a little bit. We are hearing reports of something happening at the airport, impounding a car that had been there a long time, also trying to investigate a man in Newcastle, Lawrence County. What can you tell me in terms of those two situations? Anything regarding the ongoing investigation that might or might not have happened, we're not going to discuss. We'll just discuss what's going on here uh, today. You've told us earlier today that it will take at least three to five weeks uh, before this is all wrapped up. Is that three to five weeks in good weather, or will rain kind of uh, hurt your chances to wrap this thing up within three to five weeks? It, it all depends on whatever happens. Uh, we'll deal with whatever comes up, but we will stay here until the job's done. And in your tenure here, you've never had a criminal investigation of a plane crash, is that right? No, in fact, the only anything that, that the only thing that even can compare to it is Flight 427, uh, and that was proven to be an, to be uh, a. a um, uh, an accident. All right. Well, thanks for joining us right off the top of our show. I appreciate it. We will be checking back with you. Any updates, please let us know. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank Mr. Crowley. You know, we talked about that search that is going on right now. It is it is a shoulder to shoulder search going on. It's a slow, painstaking task. And our sure reporter is. Marcy Cipriani was actually at the at the site not too long ago. What did you find at the crime scene today? Well, of the nearly 200 emergency personnel out here, I'm told 80 of them are dedicating their time specifically. Hang on, Marcy. We can't hear you very well. Okay. 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 Of the nearly 200 emergency personnel, I am told that 80 of them are actually dedicating dedicating their time to evidence recovery. Of course, very important finding that black box and just as important identifying who was aboard United Flight 93. It is evident residents here in Somerset County are in mourning along with the rest of the country, grieving yet looking for answers, answers that could lie here in Stony Creek Township among the wreckage, wreckage that is still more than a day later hard to look through. The flames from a fuel fire during the plane's impact Tuesday morning continue to burn, tires among the debris catching fire as investigators try to determine what happened to United Flight 93. We are looking to recover human remains, the black box or the voice data recorder, personal effects and aircraft parts. And that evidence recovery has begun here today. You can see behind me FBI as well as hazardous material teams looking through that wreckage. I am told they are not only here at the initial point of impact, but they are also in the woods. They say this is a long, painstaking process because everything they find is in very small pieces. The largest item that, uh, that I'm aware of is uh, what appears to be uh, the remains of an engine is a fairly large item that uh, has been identified back there. But discovery will take time. The protected crash site, according to police, is at least three miles long. Six teams are now using the daylight hours to flag evidence, photograph, and identify victims, as well as find clues. The big question, what happened aboard Flight 93 just before impact? Where was it headed? And whether or not this crash was related to the attacks on New York City? Answers investigators say will mainly come from one place. The uh, 
value of the black box or the information contained therein cannot be overstated. I mean, it's, it's invaluable. I am told recovery of that black box is especially difficult because that beacon, we hear so much about the noise the black box emits. The FBI tells me it does not work in a situation like this. It actually only sounds when an airplane is submerged in water, so that makes it a little bit more difficult for them to recover. However, they do say that, that they should be able to recover it and get a little more information on what happened. Wow. All right, Marcy, thank you. But there is some good news, too, coming out of Pittsburgh on recovery of the black box. Apparently, the search for the elusive black box is getting some help from a local college, Mike. We were talking about this earlier. CMU is allowing authorities to use their robotic helicopter. It's the 14-foot device, and it flies by computer. It creates a 3-D color image of the terrain, which would be very helpful here. The CMU chopper has also been used to map craters in the Arctic. Again, the black box is key, everyone says, to finding out exactly what happened, and hopefully this robot that CMU has could help them. That's right. We are learning also more tonight, Michelle, about the apparent heroes that were on board Flight 93. The heroes were passengers. The new information coming from emotional cell phone calls made just minutes before the 757 plummeted to its doom. Flight attendant CeCe Lyles from Florida called her husband, telling him how much she loved him and their four boys. Her husband heard screaming in the background, and she was crying when she said, We've been hijacked. Then the phone went dead. Another passenger, 38-year-old Thomas Burnett, called his wife to say he feared the flight was doomed, that we're all going to die, he said. But he and two others planned to do something about it. He said, I love you, honey. Then the call ended. Finally, there's the call made by 31-year-old passenger Mark Bingham to his mother in California. He told her, I love you very much. I'm calling you from the plane. We've been taken over. There are three men that say they have a bomb. Those are the last words spoken. He said, I want to let you know that I love you. I told him that we all love him. He said that he was on United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco and that there were three guys who had taken over the aircraft and they say they have a bomb. I asked him, who are these people? And he seemed distracted, didn't hear the question, didn't answer. Uh, then he came back on, said, it's true. Uh, and I said, I believe you. Uh, I told him I love him, uh, and then it went dead. The FBI here in Somerset County will not officially talk about any cell phone call they have uh, any information on. They believe those cell phone calls are the key to the investigation. That's right. What I want to do right now, Mike, is bring in our Team 4 investigative reporter, Paul Van Osdahl, and you had some very interesting uh, information today. Yeah, Michelle, Mike, you know, a lot of the debris that resulted from this crash, most of it ended up right around the, the perimeter of the cr crash site, within maybe 100 yards or so, but much of it, believe it or not, ended up as far as a mile and a half or two miles away. Some of it on the shoreline of a nearby lake that's quite popular as a vacation spot for Pittsburghers. A beautiful vacation retreat, Indian Lake is turning up gruesome reminders of Flight 93. Charred pieces of the plane, mutual fund statements and other paperwork, even what appears to be a bone fragment. Jim Brandt owns the Indian Lake Marina. There was debris flying everywhere. We found paperwork laying everywhere around here. Lots of papers and... Yeah, mostly uh, stock portfolio stuff. The plane crashed on the other side of the lake in the woods on the hilltop, and it wasn't long after that before folks started seeing debris here in the water. This morning, much of that debris washed ashore, and the reason for that, the prevailing winds blow into the shoreline here. Some debris was deposited in people's yards more than a mile from the crash site. Helene Pavlosak and Dottie Hughes put some of it in a bag. It looks like it may be pieces of luggage, maybe pieces of the seats. There's some paperwork in here. It looks like a bank statement. Police sealed off the Pavlosak's yard after some debris ended up there. I said, could this possibly be from the airplane due to the fact that this wasn't here prior to, and it can't have fallen off a trash truck, and they said, yes, it is, do not touch it. After talking with us, the women took the bag of debris to state police, who are turning it over to crash investigators. The FBI has been telling people, homeowners and anybody else who has come in contact with debris from the trash, from, from the wreck, not to touch it. They're, they're actually told some people it might be a biohazard, which is uh, why they're telling people not to touch it. Also, uh, even though obviously the primary concern is locating the so-called black box, 
FBI officials do say they might be able to derive some evidentiary value from some of this debris, even that some debris that's located as much as a mile or two away because of where, in fact, it's located. So Mike and Michelle, that's going to be what they're going to be doing over the next couple of days is marking where this debris is and then trying to determine what use it might have as an evidentiary uh, material. Paul, Team 4 has been investigating this case since we got word uh, the plane went down in Somerset County yesterday. I understand you uncovered new information tonight. You'll have that at 5.30. We sure will, Mike. We have some new information about what was found and what was seen at the crash site within 5 or 10 minutes of the plane disappearing into the ground. All right. Paul Van Osdo, thank you very much. We okay. will see you at 5.30. Okay. And Scott and Sally, we're going to throw it back to you. We'll see you in a little while. All right, guys, a lot to cover. In fact, the, the, the factor, there are so many bad images, but there is so much content to get through in this newscast. One of the things we want to update, we, you heard Michelle Wright ask Agent Crowley about their interest in a car found at Pittsburgh International and also a man from Newcastle. Our Shannon Perrine is in Newcastle, and we're going to be getting more from her probably in the next eight or nine minutes, so we wanted you to stay tuned for that. One of the things, as we've looked at all of the horror of what's happened, we have a story of hope out of this technology in the, in the rubble there where we had so much death. A much happier outcome, and it has made a Munhall native into something of a hero here. Sam Merrill has the story of the roundabout rescue. Into the State Department. And Today it seemed Joy Karn's phone just never stopped ringing. Like she was waiting for a call from Hello? her brother, Dave Carnes, an ex-Marine, Gulf War vet, Steel Valley High School graduate, and suddenly sought after hero. But that's like Dave. You know, he said he was going to go save lives and see where he was needed, needed and sure enough, he, he was right there. Was he ever? Dave left his Connecticut office, picked up a Marine buddy, and they bolted to Manhattan to do what the Corps taught them to do. And here, under a 40-foot mountain of misery and death, they found signs of life, two faint voices calling for help. Dave couldn't raise the local rescuers on his cell phone, but... He got through to me. So his sister, back home watching all of this, called 911 here, and they made contact in New York, and the rescuers got there in time. Dave had already started digging. They found him 40 feet down. So eventually they ended up getting down there somehow, you know, um, through the rubble because he was digging them out with his hands. Dave Carnes knows his way around the World Trade Center. He used to work for a company that was based there back in 93, the first time it was attacked. There are two guys very thankful he found his way back. In Munhall, Sam Merrill, Channel 4 Action News. Just a remarkable, remarkable. story. Remarkable. Another remarkable story. People are giving, giving right now to try and help in this disaster relief effort. We have a phone bank uh, right across the hall with the Salvation Army. The number there is 243-6000. Stephen, tell us about how much they've raised in just a little over five hours. Stephen Cropper. Well, Sally, we are coming up on the $22,000 mark, and as you mentioned, uh, we are in the disaster relief mode here. Numbness beginning to wear off just a bit after yesterday's catastrophe uh, throughout the nation, and the Salvation Army is the conduit for the viewers to actually provide some relief. Major Glenn Bloomfield is here with me, and uh, Major, you and I were just talking off camera about the, uh, the viewers need to help out. Tell me a little more about that. There's no question about that, uh, Steve. I think that within each and every one of us, God has imprinted us in such a way that we all feel that urge and that need to respond when we see people in need, regardless of who they are, where they're from in this country, and uh, as is evidenced by the ringing phones, people are responding. What sort of items or uh, what things are you looking for now? Are we in a strictly financial uh, mode now? Well, at this point, yes, Steve. Earlier today, our request from our New York office is primarily to serve those on Manhattan, mm -hmm. where the Twin Towers was, was for bottled water. Uh, the people of this community, this city, have been so responsive. We've been inundated with water that we don't need any more water, but the financial, the dollar contribution mm -hmm. will help us and is the best medium by which we can just send this money, all of it, directly to New York to serve and meet the needs of people. There. And you mentioned here locally you have sites at the uh, crash site, actually stations there. Uh, how many are there? Uh, right now there are five canteens, Steve, right at the, uh, the site. Uh, two at a command center, two at a medium, uh, the media location, uh, and uh, one that's a roving canteen around there. Okay. We will be back with Major Bloomfield throughout the newscast. The number at the bottom of your screen will continue to be there, 412-243-6000. This is your chance to help out. Scott, Sally. Thanks very much, Stephen. Okay, picture this. You are flying somewhere yesterday. 
all of a sudden you weren't planning to go to Pittsburgh or you weren't planning to go to Kentucky, for, for instance, right. and then your plane turns around and lands and you're stuck all day, all night, and most of the day. That's the case for thousands of exhausted travelers who had their flights diverted after yesterday's terrorist attack. They sat and waited for the airports to reopen. And watching local hotel rooms, the coverage. Uh, the FAA has uh, made some decisions today. They are not allowing any additional commercial flights except for the flights that had been diverted yesterday. So they're allowing some of those flights to head home. As you heard Norman Mineta say, just as we were going on the air at 5 o'clock in his news conference, that they're going to keep this uh, restriction as far as commercial flights in place for a time. We don't know if that means through tonight. Tomorrow we're going to get more on that. But let's bring in Sheldon Ingram, who is at Pittsburgh International, uh, with some information about what uh, will happen at the airport when flights are allowed to resume, first, whenever that is. Sheldon. First of all, Scott, Pittsburgh International Airport is still closed for business. The only flights that will depart this evening are the flights that were diverted to Pittsburgh yesterday because of the emergency situation. All other flights, about 90% of them, are grounded for the night. As for security here, well, Pittsburgh International Airport right now is operating at the highest level of security since the facility opened nine years ago. No, I'm still in Pittsburgh. And if I'm lucky, I'll get out of here late tonight. We're trying. No, we're, we haven't left yet. At 1.50 p.m., travelers receive word that the majority of flights out of Pittsburgh International Airport are canceled for another night. I think the main concern first is to get the people who are stranded here out first. You were actually on your flight yesterday. We were on a flight to Florida yesterday to Fort Myers on the runway when uh, the pilot announced that there had been a crash and we didn't know it first what it was. When flights finally resume, the airport will not operate business as usual. Grinding security checks and heightened sensitivity to terroristic threats dictate how and when people access the airport. The objective, keep vehicles 300 feet from the main terminal. Security is heightened. We have increased the personal checks. We have increased the scrutiny at the checkpoint. This area normally handles thousands of vehicles waiting for passengers who've just arrived at the airport. But as you can see, it's empty, and it'll remain this way today, tomorrow, the next day, until the FAA says it's safe to relax airport security. Instead, people have to be picked up and dropped off here at the long-term parking area. From here, they take the movable walkway to the main terminal. Again, the objective, according to the airport authority, is to keep vehicles at least 300 feet away from the main terminal. Only passengers are allowed beyond the security checkpoint. Even vehicles dropping off airline and airport employees are restricted. The airport authority expects gridlock once the airport opens to all air traffic. To what extent, authorities don't know. Are travelers inconvenienced? Yes. Are they complaining? No. Not when one considers the catastrophic and abominable terrorist attack on America that has ripped through the hearts of so many people. In light of what's happened, no. <laughs> uh, it's not an inconvenience whatsoever. Considering the loss that other people are enjoying. Absolutely. It's a minor inconvenience considering the loss that many other people suffered yesterday. Certainly. Didn't mind the drive at all. Again, at this hour, Pittsburgh International Airport is shut down for business as we know it. The only flights that will be going out tonight are the flights that were directed here in the emergency situation yesterday. We do not know at this moment what time those flights will take off. Also, because air traffic has been shut down across the country, we ran into several people who spent the night driving across the country to get back home to Pittsburgh. We met, met one couple who drove from Daytona Beach, Florida, and another man who drove through the night from New Orleans. Other people are renting cars here in Pittsburgh and driving back to their original locations. Reporting live from Pittsburgh International Airport, Sheldon Ingram, Channel 4 Action News. Sheldon, let me ask you, you talked about flights that had been diverted here now being allowed to leave. Some flights that had originally intended to arrive in Pittsburgh had to be diverted elsewhere yesterday and we are they going to be allowed to land or return to Pittsburgh have planes been coming in planes have not been coming in yet but this is a directive from uh, the Department of Transportation and the FAA so we expect that other airports around the country will release those flights as well that were diverted the flights originally scheduled for Pittsburgh should be coming in tonight but there's no word as to what time that's going to happen I even spoke with two people in the control tower here at Pittsburgh International Airport right now they have no idea they're waiting word from the FAA on when they can start releasing flights and receiving flights as well all right thank you sir for that now when we look back at the planes yesterday a total of four planes successfully hijacked how indeed could the terrorists have slipped by airport security slipped by security overpowered the flight crews 
from fragments of those heartbreaking cell phone conversations, we have gathered the terrorists may have used knives and box cutters to take control. Investigative reporter Jim Parsons looked into the security at Pittsburgh International, Jim. Well, Sally, federal investigators are still trying to determine uh, how terrorists may have gotten what, what are described as box cutters or utility knives, makeshift knives, on board a few of those, uh, those hijacked airliners from yesterday. But in an extraordinary interview with Team 4, a security supervisor at Pittsburgh International says she believes it could happen here. In fact, she says she believes someone could even get a gun through security. For the past year, Allison Brown has worked the security checkpoint here at Pittsburgh International. Recently, she was promoted to supervisor. She's alarmed by what she calls security lapses here. We're not trained to know what, a, what an object would look like taken apart. You just are looking for a gun. You're not it, looking for pieces of a gun. Right. Most people wouldn't know what pieces of a gun look like. You think it should be different? Most people don't even know what bullets look like on the x-ray. Allison works for Huntley Corporation, a private corporation that provides security at 56 airports, including Pittsburgh's. She says many of her fellow employees aren't trained properly and don't care about their jobs. You know, we go into work day in and day out. You know, just it's another job. Ho-hum, ho-hum. But nobody even thinks about what we're there supposed to be doing. There's no doubt about it. Security is definitely tighter here at the airport. Check this out. At the restaurants, you won't find knives anymore, only spoons and forks. But Allison Brown says that doesn't change the main problem. The main problem, she says, the hiring policy for security employees. I mean, we have a 400% turnover rate. Employees come and go in the same week. I mean, that's pretty much a big joke around Huntley. You know, people come in, oh, well, how long are these ones going to last? Allison says Huntley starts its security workers at $6.50 an hour. That's less than fast food workers here make, less than what janitors make. William Scott is a former airport security employee who now works for U.S. Air Express. He agrees with Allison. Yep. I walked right through there before in just the past two weeks, and I've rang, and nobody said nothing. So you'd go through, and it yeah. would ring? And it would ring, and I went right through. And I just hope for the people in America that this stops. You know, for security, that's what we need to be. We don't need to be just there you know, for socialization. We don't need to just be there for a paycheck. We need to be there because we want the airlines to be safe, and most of them aren't. Now, we did speak with Huntley Regional Manager David Weekly this afternoon. He refused to discuss, declined to discuss anything to do with security. I asked him, why is Huntley only paying its employees six and a half dollars an hour? Why do you only have mostly part-time employees? Why is your turnover rate so high? He said the FAA would not allow him to discuss those kinds of issues. Some alarming uh, uh, allegations being made here by Allison Brown. Reporting live at Pittsburgh International Airport, Jim Parsons, Channel 4 Action News. All right, tr troubling for our so. whole nation, thanks. The nation's capital, by the way, returned to a strained calm today. Members of Congress reconvened, the federal buildings reopened as the National Guard patrolled the streets and the Pentagon continued to smolder. Let's go to Lori Kinney, live in D.C. for the latest. Lori. Well, Scott, the message from leaders, including President Bush, on down today was that yesterday's attacks will not go unpunished and that Americans should try to return to normal life. One day after the devastating attacks on U.S. targets, President Bush used strong words of condemnation. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. In yet more shocking news, the administration confirmed that Air Force One and the White House itself were also believed to be intended targets of yesterday's attacks. As investigators searched wreckage at the Pentagon and in New York with dwindling hope of finding survivors, the president said he will ask Congress for emergency funding so authorities can spend whatever it takes to rescue victims and beef up security. And the Secretary of State announced efforts to unite international allies, including in the case of possible military action. And we're building a strong coalition to go after these perpetrators, but more broadly, to go after terrorism wherever we find it in the world. Meantime, in one of the day's most dramatic developments, a heavily armed FBI team stormed a Boston hotel, looking for evidence and possibly suspects. Investigators are at work in Florida, too, questioning people who may have known the hijackers. We will leave no stone unturned in our quest to help find those responsible and to bring those individuals to justice. The mood remains... 
Well, for the last 33 hours, our phone lines, our email lines have been flooded with the emotions of folks from around this area reacting to the pain of so many like Mr. Gay. We thought we would take a few moments here and read a few of your thoughts. This comes from our forum on the Pittsburgh Channel. The attack on the Twin Towers was the most devastating scene I have ever witnessed. I don't know anyone in New York, but as the event was unfolding, I felt I had a loved one there. The attack on the Pentagon was a national slap in the face. Here's another. Please do something to show these cowards that we are still the strongest country and that we will stick together and get through this. And one more. This tragedy is the worst that Americans have had to endure, but we will remain strong. You can log on to our website, the Pittsburgh Channel, to share your thoughts. You're also going to find continuous updates from both the local and national level. We'll have the latest video out of New York and Washington and discussion forums there for you to give your opinion, your ideas. Plus, we'll have all of the numbers that we've had on this broadcast, blood donors, phone numbers, sites, maps, a list of prayer services, and links for adults and children on dealing with this tragedy. You can find all of that at the Pittsburgh Channel. We have talked uh, here today about uh, the recovery efforts both in Somerset and in New York where they did find apparently another woman today making six pulled from the rubble and there may be more as we've talked to experts. Uh, that is not the case at the Pentagon. It doesn't look like there's going to be any more survivors there. The number of dead at the Pentagon may not be quite as high as authorities had feared. Today the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld who himself had gone down to help uh, load the injured onto stretchers said that the uh, some of the estimates you may have heard of 800 dead may be far too high, but they really don't have precise numbers available. A fiery Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum today took the Senate floor. He urged his fellow senators to make sure the country has the necessary resources to defend itself as preparation for war. This is not a time to bring people to justice. It is a time to wage war and win a war against those who committed this act those who harbor those who committed this act, and those who support and encourage those who committed this act. Senator Santorum called uh, it not a hijacking attack, but uh, enemy missiles. Yeah, turning our United planes States. into missiles. That's right. Strong words, too, today from U.S. Representative John Murtha. There's speculation that some passengers on Flight 93 may have fought with the terrorists. In fact, we've heard, we talked a lot earlier about the cell phone calls from that plane hinting about some kind of onboard altercation. Today, Congressman Murtha toured the Somerset crash site and he talked to reporters right afterwards. The target was uh, Washington, D.C., in my estimation, a significant target in Washington, D.C. And, and I would conclude that there was a struggle and a he heroic individual decided they were going to die anyway. Let's bring the plane down here. Congressman Murtha saying that he believes that this plane may have been uh, heading for Washington, and we do know that was something we did hear from Ari Fleischer today, that they do believe. And th also uh, John, Ar uh, d uh, the uh, Attorney General saying that they had threats to the White House and to Air Force One itself. So we just don't know. It explains but the movements of the president it, yesterday. It does indeed. There in the nation's capital today, unbelievably in some ways, workers headed back to their jobs at the Pentagon, even as the smoke continue to pour out of that nerve center for America's military. Our Washington reporter Alex Lee was at the Pentagon and on the streets of the nation's capital. Alex, what's the mood there today? Well, Scott and Sally, I'll tell you, it's an eerie mixture of activity and a deep sense of sadness. Um, as you said, the government, including the Pentagon and Congress, were open for business, but it's clear that things are not the same. Rescue crews started today to pull bodies from the collapsed area of the Pentagon. Tracy Rowan Horse still hasn't heard from her husband, who worked as an Army accountant near the section hit by the hijacked plane. I am praying and hoping that him or anybody else from that department can be found. But authorities say they do not expect to find any more survivors. Although there's no word on the exact number of casualties, some officials think one to 200 people are dead or missing, a lower estimate from last night. Even with smoke still pouring from the military's headquarters, some Pentagon employees returned to work. Army Staff Sergeant Desmond Hunter described the mood inside. Well, it's uh, very somber right now. Meantime, back in downtown Washington, most streets are now open, including here on Pennsylvania Avenue. Most businesses are open, subways are running, many people showed up at work. I specifically came to work today because I felt it was important to get back into the groove, to 
get the nation up and going. But it's clearly not business as usual. There's heightened security around the Capitol building and the White House. Military police are stationed at intersections. The government was open but allowed employees to stay home. Schools are closed. The city is still under a state of emergency. No, it's not back to normal. Uh, it's going to take a long time. But it seems to be quiet, a solemn, kind of somber, peaceful feeling. A feeling perhaps embodied by this woman outside the Pentagon praying for the victims. Now, as far as the airports here go, flights do remain grounded at both Dulles and Reagan National, but authorities did open up the terminals at about 3 o'clock this afternoon, so passengers who got stuck here yesterday could go back and retrieve their luggage. Scott and Sally, back to you. Alex, Washington is uh, so, so much a place open to the citizens. Uh, we have so many monuments there. Any idea when they're going to reopen? Well, Scott, uh, the federal monuments along the National Mall here actually did reopen this afternoon. And I'll tell you, I went over to the White House not long ago, and Pennsylvania Avenue, right in front of the White House, was open to pedestrian traffic. So tourists came right up to the gate, were able to take pictures, uh, getting fairly close to the White House. And I even talked to a woman there who said she took the public tour inside the White House this morning, and she said she actually found that very reassuring. Scott? All right, Alex, thank you for that. Now, here in Pittsburgh, no credible threat to anybody here, so it's not a, an intelligent reaction, but an emotional one. You wonder, as workers were heading back downtown to their offices today, about their feelings. And there was some unease. In fact, we talked to some of those who worked inside Pittsburgh's tallest building, the USX Tower. So at first, it was just a, a panic, and then as it started to set in, our thoughts were, wow, you know, could, it, could we be next? You know, we knew we were the tallest building here in Pittsburgh, so at that point, we thought the word was going to come that we were going to be asked to evacuate, and that's what happened. Coming back, I had reservations. My wife did. She really didn't want me to come in. And I said, well, we have to go to work. And I says, whatever happens, you know, I leave it in the hands of, you know, I leave it in the hands of God. You are watching Action News right now on the uh, attack on America, continuing our coverage of what has been happening today in both Somerset County, New York City, and Washington, D.C., and in the search for those involved with the hijackers and the investigation of who those hijackers were. All right, our coverage continues. We have uh, some ideas of what's happened. If you're just joining us, just getting home from work, we're going to tell you the latest. People have been taken into custody for questioning in both Boston and South Florida. As uh, police and riot gear went into the locations in Boston, we're getting information about that. We also know that the remaining portion of the South World Trade Center tower did collapse in the last hour. We don't know about the impact on the ground, any rescuers or those who may remain trapped in the rubble. In addition to that, flight data recorders have not been recovered in Somerset. That is an intense focus there to get that black box. And we learned one interesting thing at the beginning of our 5 o'clock broadcast. We had I, I wondered about the beacon that might sound, but those beacons are only activated when the boxes go into water, when they're submerged. So this is going to be a difficult process of digging as they look for the black box in Somerset. Right now we want to go back to that crash site in Somerset County where they are continuing the search for evidence, mapping and gridding, and looking for that vital black box. Yeah. Michelle Wright and Mike Clark. Yeah. Uh, Mike and Michelle have been out there all day and they join us now with more on the search and some of the other things we're learning. That's right, uh, Scott and Sally. The main focus, the primary focus here this evening and throughout the day has been finding those two black boxes. And federal investigators say, Michelle, that that black box may hold the answers to not only this crash site, but the other three hijacked planes. Reporter Susan Copen has been investigating that part of the story. She joins us now live. Uh, Susan, what have you learned about the black box search? Well, we do know that there is a team of 80 investigators that are out there in the woods right now at the crash site. They are walking basically shoulder to shoulder looking for any clues looking for the black boxes and the black boxes were in the tail of that plane and we know that the plane went down nose first so there is a good chance that these black boxes might be found and talking to an aviation expert today he said not only is there a good chance these black boxes will be found but he also said there will probably be very useful information the FBI calls this investigation painstaking. It will likely take three to five weeks. A main objective, the recovery of the black boxes on board. They could hold the key to what happened minutes before Flight 93 crashed the ground. The uh, value of the black box or the information contained therein cannot be overstated. I mean, it's, it's invaluable, assuming we are able to recover an item that can be worked with. 
Pennsylvania Congressman John Murtha, who represents Somerset County, thinks the plane was heading for Washington, D.C., and something happened on that plane, possibly an effort to ditch the plane in a rural area. I personally think that uh, this black box in this incident could be a key because I think personally there was a struggle in that airplane before it hit the ground and uh, somebody made a heroic effort to keep that from uh, hitting uh, uh, a populated area. Aviation expert Craig Conroy. Do they have a better chance of finding the black boxes here at this crash than say in New York City or at the Pentagon? I think they have a very good chance here. I, I would think it'd be in the high 90 percent that they'll be A, retrieved, and B, they'll have useful data on them. Useful data, including conversations in the cockpit and if the plane had mechanical problems. And once again, those black boxes are located in the tail of the airplane. And in this case, with the plane going nose first into the ground, that is a good sign that those black boxes might be in good shape. And as you heard the aviation expert saying, he thinks there's a 90% chance that the black boxes are going to be recovered and that right. there's going to be useful information. He said if they find those boxes in the next couple days, we might actually have information by next week from those boxes. That quickly. Yeah. That's great. And when we were talking to Congressman Murtha earlier today, he's convinced that those black Black boxes will show that there was some sort of struggle on the cockpit and a hero is, right. sh should be yeah, recognized. I think that's his theory that there was in fact a struggle and we're getting some of that information from the folks who made the cell phone calls to their relatives saying they were going to do something about this. Um, and the information that we can get from these black boxes will have uh, conversations that took place in the cockpit and hopefully there will be information on exactly what happened. All right, Susan, thank you. And I'm sure, Mike, the families are especially yeah. interested in finding out the information from those black boxes. Not only the investigators, but certainly the families. And speaking of the families, we learned today at the 4 o'clock news conference that at least one family has boarded a bus from Newark, New Jersey. Um, eight members of one of the victim's families is headed to Pennsylvania. In fact, that family may already be here. Uh, United set up a reception for them at Seven Springs, and they also set up a media room, so if any family wishes to talk to the media, um, they can do so there. Right, all the family members are invited to come, but so far we only know of the one family with eight members And, and if they do have way. something to say, uh, we of course will bring that to you live tonight at 11 o'clock. Now, there have been lots of different accounts from witnesses on the ground about what they saw, and we want to take a close look at that right now. That's right. Team 4 investigator Paul Van Osdal has been looking into very serious claims that there was another plane in the air minutes after this crash. What have you been able to gather, Paul? Well, Mike, Michelle, ever since the crash, we have been hearing rumors not only that there was another plane, but that perhaps the plane that crashed, Flight 93, was shot down. Now, the government flatly denies those rumors, but today I talked to four witnesses to the crash who were on the scene within five five minutes of the crash who did tell me they saw another plane. Now the mystery remains, where did this plane come from and who did it belong to? Jim Brandt was one of the first people to arrive at the crash site less than five minutes after the plane hit the ground. Above the wreckage, he saw something strange. We were walking back towards the crater and uh, we saw a second plane flying circles in the uh, vicinity right above the plane. and. Uh, it stayed there for approximately a minute or two, and then it just took off. Tom Spinelli, who was with Brandt, also saw the plane. Anything strike you about this airplane? Just the high wings in the back. I noticed the back wings were pretty high off the fuselage. Were there any markings on the airplane? No, it was all white. Civilian and military aircraft typically have markings on their tails, but both men swear they saw no marks. We all looked at it and said, you know, what's he doing? We had no idea what was happening at that time. What was going through your mind when you saw that second plane? We were watching up in the air at it, making sure it wasn't coming down. Today, Congressman John Murtha responded to rumors that Flight 93 may have been shot down. The Secretary of Defense has told me personally the United States was not involved in shooting down the airplane. There may have been smaller airplanes in the area, as well as perhaps commercial aircraft. But uh, to be specific, I, I don't know. Well, the FBI may be flatly denying that there were uh, any other military aircraft in the area, as they said, but that the fact remains that they have spoken to Jim Brandt and some of the other people who were witnesses to seeing this plane. They were just questioning them yesterday and today, asking them what they saw, whether they saw any markings, whether they thought it was a military or a civilian aircraft, and basically uh, Jim Brandt and his, his uh, co-workers told the FBI exactly what they told me, that they didn't see any markings. And that, uh, Mike and Michelle, is the most mysterious thing about this. Why was there a plane flying with no markings? Because any civilian aircraft should have a number on the tail that would indicate uh, who it's registered to. So that's the, the thing that 
that we're going to be trying to find out over the next few days. Sure, and in the latest FBI press conference, we asked the question, is there any indication from the wreckage that there might have been some sort of military activity involved? They could not comment, but they, uh, in essence, said that there was no indication as far as they know. They could not tell us anything, Paul, but I'm curious, did, uh, did Mr. Brandt say the FBI said anything to him about uh, any knowledge of a second plane? Well, he says that they indicated that they knew nothing about a second plane, uh, basically what they said earlier, that uh, they knew nothing, and they were quizzing him, though, quite intently about what he saw, and they, and they were really curious about what he saw and what some of the other people saw there. I'm curious to know that if, this, if there was a second plane, would there be any record of it on radar, anything recorded at the Somerset County Airport? Well, we talked to an aviation expert earlier today who, who did indicate that there would be something on radar, but the interesting thing is, as we know, the uh, FAA basically shut down the skies at about noon yesterday, but uh, of course the crash occurred at about 10 o'clock in the morning, so it is possible that there could have been some civilian aircraft in the air at the time of the crash, but what would be curious is, to, is why these aircraft would not have any markings on them whatsoever. All right, well, hopefully we'll get some answers on that soon. We certainly hope to. Thanks, Paul. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, the the I guess what we can tell you tonight, the FBI did not say much about that second plane, but they did tell us that there will be a, a news conference tomorrow at 1030. We hope to learn more then. That ongoing search, that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder search uh, by technicians out in the field right now is continuing. They're probably going to do that until the sun goes down tonight. Again, the primary focus here, the black box, but they are marking things along the way. We will keep you posted from the Somerset County site, Sally and Scott. Guys, any word on the uh, families uh, uh, that I, I know at least one family has been contact contacted and is headed out to Seven Springs. Um, can you tell me if there are any others or have they arrived? What's the status? That's the only family the FBI indicated to us at around 4 o'clock. They told us uh, nothing more than they're on their way from Newark, New Jersey. Um, I know that in other plane crashes, airlines will fly uh, in families and, and keep them close to the scene and cl close to the information that they so desperately need to get. I'm sure all of the families have been alerted and invited to come. Um, United is doing that. They're bringing a crisis management team to the scene. But right now, we know of only one family that has taken them up on that invitation. That will be at Seven Springs. And there's also a media room to where if this family wants to make any kind of a statement at all, we will be able to bring that to you. It is too early to know that. We know that they are en route by bus, and there's no indication now that they are at Seven Springs but we will let you know. And Sally and Scott, we should tell you that by the nature of the three cell phone calls that we know that were made from the plane, two of the families are from the San Francisco area in California. The other one um, was from Florida. So these families are coming great distances, and um, you can understand why they're not flying. Uh, flying. So they're probably going to drive great lengths to get here. Uh, Mike, let me ask you about that, if they've uh, talked about that out there. Uh, we, we know about the three people, and also of a fourth call, the one from the person in the bathroom who did not identify themselves when they called Westmoreland County 911. So we know about the flight attendant who called her husband uh, with uh, the terrible news, about the man who called his wife in San Francisco, about the son who called his mother. Uh, do we know that the, uh, the man who told his wife that he was going to mount some kind of action on the plane, or the son, if they may be the man in the bathroom who also called 911? We can tell you this, Westmoreland County 911 confirmed for us that that 911 call did exist. Apparently this man did identify himself, but they are not releasing to us the name of that individual. And there is no indication that it is the same individual. All the FBI is telling us it's, is that they believe there were four calls made. The FBI does have in their possession, in its possession, that 911 call, but they are not giving us any further details other than it lasted about a minute long and the plane crashed some 10 minutes after that. But Last night I asked Captain Frank Monaco of the state police uh, that very question, Scott and Sally, that uh, could that unnamed fourth call be one of the three calls that, uh, that we're, we know were made? Um, he had no indication that was, so we're, we are believing that there was a fourth call made. Well, eventually we will find out the name when the FBI does decide to release it, and, and at least that mystery will be solved. Uh, an amazing amount of information.